have this Me Too thing figured out yet? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Welcome aboard on this Monday night. I'm grieving. Uh, Yankees get beaten game seven. The Giants are nowhere to be found. And uh, Patriots, uh, shut up, Kevin. <laughs> and Patriots Nation is uh, foggy. <laughs> uh, he barely saw the football last night. It's amazing. We've got to get somebody in on the, on the science of when the temperature meets the humidity or the dew point or whatever, you can't see a football game. Anyway, uh, that's my sports commentary for this evening, whether you like it or not. Nice to have you aboard. That is my state of mind this evening. Good night. Uh, no, let's talk about this Me Too thing. It has been a week now of national and local conversation. I think in Rhode Island here, we were treated to an interesting exercise with a state representative who spouted off about her uh, life experiences, not just in general, but specific in the legislature, and we will talk about that a little bit, but we have two fine guests to try to bring some perspective on this this evening. In the meantime, we have some political news I just wanted to mention. Uh, here at the top of the show, we have a new entry into the governor's race. Patricia Morgan cites her experiences. She is the minority leader, and she would tell you that she's the first female minority leader, and so when asked if she's, uh, you know, thinking and worrying about the competition inside the Republican, pro uh, Republican primary, she says, no, my competition is Governor Raimondo, which is, I guess, the go-to thing to say. But uh, Patricia's entry into the primary field complicates that field because State Representative Joe Trillo is already in it, and Ellen Fung, the mayor of Cranston, who came, what, six, seven points uh, uh, second to Governor Raimondo in the last election, is announcing he's running tomorrow. Uh, Link Chafee reportedly is got the green light from his wife, I'm told, and has all of the money in the world on that side to be able to dig into Governor Raimondo's 40% at most popularity. And so we probably have a Democratic primary as well. It's going to get very interesting in 2018. I don't know that we have any blue chip candidates, but it's going to get interesting in 2018. All right. So me too, right? So this knucklehead is the, is the, uh, the troublemaker that causes all of this I don't know. Uh, I, I don't even know how to position it, to be honest with you, other than, you know, he's a pig, and we all know that. So now the entire country is reeling from his exercise, right? We get uh, headlines uh, locally as well, and we have uh, a movement on social media and beyond called Hashtag Me Too. Survivor. I'm not a victim. It happened to me too. Me too. Sexual assault happens to everyone. It happened to me too. I was told not to talk about it. I was told that it wasn't that bad. And I was told to get over it. All right. And in addition, well, I just want to let you know uh, that if you didn't know this already, it's a difficult conversation. So says our guest. Discomfort keeps us silent. We fail to show up for the survivors who need us. And even worse, we don't get any better at talking about sexual violence because talking about uncomfortable things is a skill. Being uncomfortable is a skill. It takes practice. The more you do it, the better you'll get. Well, I should have you as a tutor to all my guests. I don't care what the content is. I would love that. The uncomfortable <laughs> conversation is kind of what we have here from, from time to time. Welcome in. Thank you. Uh, Thanks the, for having the me. The un Comfortable Conversation, Sarah, is your business. It is my organization, yes. Your organization. Yep. All right, we'll get back to you in a second. And uh, from Brown University, a professor of economics and public policy, but who has a take on this conversation, no doubt, is Professor Anna Azer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, where does the economics come into expertise all come into all of this? Okay. Well, I think you can think of this behavior in the context of women's economic status more generally. It's not a surprise, right, that Harvey Weinstein is an incredibly powerful figure, an incredibly rich, rich figure, and someone who can basically make these young women's careers. These women are relatively, um, they're, much not, they're much less powerful. Uh, they have fewer resources. They really are very junior to him in this respect. And so it's really not surprising that you see him using this power to basically uh, do things that are, uh, as, as he's sort of done, this sort of sexual harassment that well, we're seeing. Well, they're many, and it depends on the person you're speaking with or about, they're junior to him until they do build their own audience. All right. And, so and their own he, constituents. He didn't, he didn't right. harass Meryl Streep, right? Mm. 
yeah. he harassed these sort of young women who really did not have the same kind of power that he had. Okay. Uh, we have satellite Me Too conversations now going yeah. on. Uh, we'll talk about the local one here in a second. But in general, your take on this is what? I know you've uh, written in the social media world. You've actually yeah. written to the new organizer of this hashtag Me Too thing, and you yeah. try to send a message. What was it? I mean, I think that that these hashtags and public spaces for conversations about sexual violence, I think social media is a great place to break the ice. It's not a place to have a deep conversation. And so um, while we're thinking about social media, remembering that an overwhelming avalanche of sharing your story for the one in four women and the one in six men who have actually experienced sexual violence in their lifetimes, that's a, that can be a hard couple of days. Can we distinguish between violence and harassment? Is there one? Yeah, so, I, so for uh, my definition would be, it, my definition is that sexual violence is unwanted sexual contact of any kind, so sexual contact without consent. So that consent needs to be affirmative. You can't give consent if you are underage, if you are intoxicated. Um, sexual harassment is, is more of a condition within an organization or an environment that, um, that allows for sexual conversation, sexual behaviors to take place that makes somebody a not okay to work, right? Right. So, for the both of you, is there I don't know, is there a different message about the difference between the two? I mean, clearly, I mean, I, some of this stuff is common sense. I, I really there's there's a, such a common sense aspect to this that I'm, I'm trying to figure out where the mystery is here. Weinstein's a pig, and he's been violent with his sexual behavior in addition to in addition to probably harassing people. It's a male-dominated culture still, I would guess it's fair to say. And so the harassment thing, when you say one out of four women are victims of sexual violence, that does not include harassment. That does not include harassment. Got it. So is there data or is there a number that you guys feel is, 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 um, is, is part of the, mm -hmm. the sexual harassment yeah. environment? That's a great question. So if you want to look for sort of official numbers on the prevalence of, of harassment, they're very hard to get. You can go to sort of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and they have numbers of cases that have been filed in the past year, and it's about 12 or 13,000. That's clearly an undercount. What I thought was the real advantage of the Me Too campaign was that there was finally getting to be some awareness of just how common this is, right? Because Which we is? we don't because we don't have really any we don't follow this in any kind of regular way so the me too campaign was sort of the first moment in which there was some sort of recognition that hey maybe this is a big problem that we need to think about maybe we do need to start collecting information actually gather statistics on how often this has happened because that's not something we currently do i think that would absolutely be a tremendous idea i mean i think that that understand you know that what for me, looking at the connection between sexual harassment and sexual violence, um, which again, one in six men are all, have also experienced sexual violence in their lifetimes, and so I just don't want to forget about those um, those male survivors. I think gender is a part of this conversation, but it's not actually not the whole conversation. Um, but you know, is that you know there are the silence. I love that you say like this stuff is just so obvious. I mean, like why do we have to have a conversation about it? It's just so obvious. I'm not right? saying, no, I'm not questioning why yep. we have to have a conversation about it. I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that <laughs> identifying the behavior is fairly simple to do. It, it, mm -hmm. What you do about the behavior makes it more complicated, well, I think. But I think identifying I, the behavior is, is, is pretty simple. Identifying the behavior requires a victim to come forward in an environment that they believe is safe to do so. And so the challenge when we have silence inside of an organization or just in our culture at large, right, is that Victims don't feel safe to come forward. They don't think that they're going to believe, be believed. Maybe they think that um, people, you know, that their organization is going to fire them or ask them a lot of questions. And so I think what we're seeing now is that there is solidarity in coming together as a, as a group of, of survivors where people are feeling like, now maybe it's safe for me to tell my story. And so, so I think it's, but you know, the questions that I have about, orga you know, about organizations or the questions that I have in the wake of this is why aren't there more organizations who three weeks ago weren't, ask, you know, weren't asking themselves, gosh, 
I wonder what our, the rate of sexual harassment or sexual violence inside my organization is. Maybe I should understand the climate and culture. I wonder if people would feel, feel comfortable. Have I said to my employees that this kind of behavior is not tolerable and defined exactly what it is? Yeah, well, the last time I was in a corporate setting, I'm telling you it's years ago, it's not recent. They, they, we had the very Sesame Street type of videos. I mean, I say Sesame Street when, I, when they were actually so uncomfortably awkward to watch that uh, everyone was in a fetal position watching it, you know, 100 staffers watching. It's kind of, and, and it was just the, 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 the role plays were so obvious. It, and so I, in, in either company that I've worked for, I haven't seen a video or an orientation on this thing in years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we got to get back to that business? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I'll say one other thing, which is that in the case of Harvey Weinstein in particular, not, most of these women didn't work for him, right? Which sort of complicates things, right. right? So they don't even have an HR department that they can go and complain to. Right. And as this economy is moving more and more towards a gig economy, you're going to have more and more of these informal sort of arrangements where the person you may be working for is not necessarily your employer. And so that just sort of complicates things and makes it, I think, all the more important yeah. to really get a handle on this because I think that kind of arrangement is actually more precarious. Yet I do think corporate HR departments are pretty tuned up for this. I mean, you know, when, when complaint comes mm -hmm. up the pipeline, they're pretty much in a almost uh, robotic default position to, to approach the thing. And most of these, most of them, I would guess, are these conflicts are resolved inside well, that environment rather than blowing up so publicly. Some, some of them are, but I think that, that a commonly used tactic is a non-disclosure agreement. And so there's, you know, in a lot of cases, we just would never know, right? Sort of, you know, how it, how it plays out. And so if you're faced with a, a situation if somebody is higher up, has sexually assaulted you, um, and it, it's you or them, and the organization decides that they're going to cut you a check and ask you to leave and not say anything. And so I think in a lot of ways, some of these stories really stay behind closed doors and that we, you know, as, as um, Professor was saying, just that we don't really fully understand the scope of the problem and therefore how to solve it. And I, I, I let me come back, I, I want to talk about some more, obviously, about the Teresa Tansy thing, but I want to talk about the low percolating stuff. I mean, in this world today, everything is high drama, crush, kill, destroy, settlement lawsuits, fire, unelect. How about just real people trying to get along, you know? and, and Say I'm sorry every once in a while. We'll be right back. I was surprised and a little overwhelmed, but there was, to me, the opportunity that I have my whole life been waiting for to change this culture that exists was handed to me. And I happen to be in a position that many women are not in. I am an elected official. I have an amplified voice. And after the hashtag happened, Me Too, I had a million people behind me who were affirming that these are real experiences. We could spend all day digging down on this particular story because there's politics involved, no doubt. But uh, State Representative Teresa Tanzi, who's, I'm sure we can have a headline there, kept to, to remind everybody what happened here, she told the journal that she had been harassed over her lifetime in various positions, and specifically uh, offered the unknown uh, leader in the legislature who suggested her legislation would be advanced for sexual favors. Um, you can't analyze the story on a soundbite, that's for sure. But the idea that, that, you know, I've been waiting my whole life type of thing, I get her context. At the same time, there's a lot of opportunism in this conversation going on right now. There's a lot of politics being played uh, in this conversation. And I think it's really hard for well-meaning people to understand what's going on here, uh, what the rules are in receiving these stories, how to judge these stories. Uh, we had a lot of, including the governor, by the way, the female governor who said she doesn't have to, but if she does, we should name the guy and get it out there in transparency. And I'm thinking, well, wait a second. First of all, A, she doesn't have to. Don't fall into that trap. B, uh, there is due process in HR. We're not talking about violence, reportedly. We're talking about harassment. 
And we do have a court of public opinion that will finish anybody who's named that way. It gets very hard, doesn't it? It's, don't you agree? I do. Yeah. I mean, I, I see that. I don't know what you're going to say that's really smart about it because I don't know who can say anything <laughs> that's what could, you well, know what I mean, I mean? I, you're I, saying, yeah, you know, I mean, sorry. The, the issue is bigger than one person correct it's bigger than Harvey Weinstein correct and you know as a as a scientist the way I would think about it is here's an issue there seems to be some public interest in this now there hadn't been that much public interest in it before let's use this as an opportunity to gather some data so we really have a sense of how big a problem this is take it from there and then consider sort of a solution to this problem. Well, if you, well, here's the, here's the, you said it before, the data is hard to gather because not everybody's a willing participant in, mm -hmm. in offering the data. Mm -hmm. And the data's got to be protected because people... Yes, the data needs to be protected. All, all sides right. of the aisle have mm -hmm. to be protected in, in the gather, yeah. the, mm -hmm. in the data gathering mm -hmm. process, correct? Well, and I th yeah, and I think that we're putting an unnecessary onus on um, victims or survivors to change this conversation and change this power dynamic and change this culture, right? And so, you know, I think one of the challenges with the public spotlight is that it's like this laser beam that shines down on a particular incident one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And the less interesting conversations, though I would argue the more important ones, are the conversations that happen, you know, the conversations that parents are having with their kids, the conversations that managers are having with their employees about how you normalize just here's what's acceptable behavior, here's how we define consent, here's how you respond if somebody tells you that something like this has happened, here's how you intervene if you witness something that's happened. So I think instead of, you know, if, if we responded to each allegation, instead of saying, wow, let's talk about the person who's saying this happened to them, I'd like to talk about their high school principal and whether or not consent was a, man, was a required topic for them to graduate from high school. I'd like to talk to their last employer and find out whether or not they were trained on sexual harassment with videos that were better than Sesame Street. That, I mean, these are the questions that I would have. These would be, to me, interesting, you know, interesting questions and interesting stories to start to uncover. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Professor, you're going to have to come up with a process mm -hmm. by which to gather the data, because I think that's as hard as solving the problem itself. I agree. I mean, these are typically done with surveys. Uh, if you want information on violence, there the Department of Justice has a national crime victimization survey that they field every year to get a sense of how many people have been the victims of crime. I mean, we do this on a regular basis. There's no reason that either the government or some other organization couldn't field the same kind of well, survey. Well, here's the thing. It seems to me it makes perfect sense. But surveys, like polls, are only as good as the questions that you ask. True. Mm -hmm. And so, y y so we have to have an informed public to understand the difference between violence and harassment, levels mm -hmm. of harassment, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe there's different kinds of flavors and definitions that have to be out there. I mean, I don't know that you get good data until you get an informed marketplace to respond to the good questions. I mean, again, you go back to, well, a lot of this is self-explanatory. Yet, if I'm, if I'm filling out, a, have I ever been sexually harassed? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, we I do, don't know, yeah. And, and most, most good surveys on sexual violence uh, and sexual assault in, include, uh, you know, some Instruction. inter instructions, yeah. in-person interviews, some kind of definition. I think there, in, in higher ed, there actually was a very a, a great survey that included, it was, you know, several tens of thousands of respondents across 27 different universities that really sort of explored what campus climate was about, mm -hmm. what, sort of what the campus climate was, mm -hmm. what people's experiences and were. And reportedly, the campus climate's not good. No, I mean, it's, it's not good, but I think, you know, where, where you're right is that it's, you know, asking questions with an, with, um, with an open mind, to, you know, for, as an example in that survey, is that what made the headline was incidents of sexual violence, only incidents among women. What I thought was the most interesting finding in that particular survey was that 70% of the people who reported that they were victimized said that they told somebody else on campus even though they didn't report through formal mechanisms. So to me, that says, wow, we ought to do a better job of training first year students on how to respond to a friend a little bit more than, you know, sort of, you know, in addition to what consent looks All like. All right, so what's the suggestion on that and just everyday handling of this thing when it comes up when we come back? Stay with us.
All right, so I, I, I do think that, that well-meaning people need to at least take a few notes as to how to behave, right? Or this, what's more important, advising people on how to behave, which I think is more common sense than not, or advising people on how to react to situations that they see vis-a-vis -vis the friend on the campus or the, the, the co-worker or the, you know, do we, do we what, what, what? I think do we it's navigating, I mean, I, it's not because it's just the name of, of the work that I do, but I really do think it's the skill of navigating an uncomfortable conversation, right? Is that as, you know, as we as humans are interacting with each other about relationships, about sex, about sexuality, about sort of what's acceptable behavior, it's like these all push on very kind of uncomfortable topics that we all assume everyone's on the same page as us. Hmm. I was just going to say, I don't see why we have to pick one or the other seems to me that the most effective strategy would be to have conversations with all these people about both their behavior and what to do if they are confronted with this behavior and also what to do if they hear about this behavior. I don't think we need to pick one or the other. And your gut tells you what should be done in either one of those scenarios. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do a two-minute how-to here for the audience. Well, I, I, so I think it will be one is look in the mirror and ask yourself, do you really understand the definition of sexual harassment and sexual violence? There are plenty of great online places where you can go and get those definitions. Right, by right? the way, the harassment thing in many ways is, is defined by power. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. It's right? much more about power than it is power. about... Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of locker room talk that goes on out in the world that has very little to do with power. Some of it is, uh, has a flavor of power, then there's power... I mean, there's so many degrees. Communication is is a complicated yeah. thing between people, and there are there are levels. Yes. So the so orientation needs to be there in terms of what the levels are. Look, I think right now at the Rhode Island State House, they're all kind of looking at each other, saying, "Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. See you later." Hi, how are you? Because they're all so nervous up there. Between men and women, right now, there's going to be this awkwardness based on the Teresa Tansy story. And good, let everybody kind of, you know, get their act together, and then. But they probably need a little bit of an orientation session up there as to uh, what's proper and what's not so they can find some default positions so they can interact with each other again. Because I know it's a tension convention up there right now, uh, right? And it should uh, yeah. be at a certain <laughs> level. Um, but I, it just seems, uh, even the corporate video I saw 10 years ago, I'm going to tell you something, for the week afterwards, everyone was kind of like, hi, how are you? Hi, good to see you. I mean, everyone was very, very careful with each other. And so uh, this is not easy. I'm not sh totally sure I agree with you. I don't know what this is. I hate it when I get disagreements with 30 <laughs> seconds left in the show. Okay, finish it up real quick. I have not spent any time in the State House, but if all it took was one woman to talk about one potential case of sexual harassment for, get, for everybody to sort of be on their toes, we would be over this problem a long time ago. I'm not saying it's long lasting. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I, fair enough. It, it could be two hours. Okay. But, I, but you just kind of instinctively, and what I've heard is kind of like everyone's, <laughs> of course, they're not in session right now. Okay. It'll well, be interesting to see you know, what maybe happens. Maybe that's not I mean, a bad thing for everybody to be chill. uh, yeah, but chilling and very conscious chilling. of sort of their behavior. All right. No. Well, there you go. There's a final <laughs> thought on that. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We didn't solve the world's problems in 20 minutes. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Thank you for your expertise, though. Thank final you. word when we come back. So she is running for governor, Patricia Morgan, the state representative. Uh, she's a tiger, uh, and she's going to be an interesting player in this maybe three-way primary, and she'll be here tomorrow night to talk to us about her goals and ambitions on the political scene. All right. So, by the way, our, our midnight show tomorrow night might be a little late for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday due to Fox World Series stuff, but uh, 7.30 on my ITV, primetime, of course. See you on the radio at 3 tomorrow on WPR as well. Thanks for watching. Good night.